Give that to the Lord. Give that to the Lord. Amen. While you're standing, why don't you give Pastor Daryl and Lenita Williams a great standing ovation right now for 10 beautiful years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to brag on you a little bit. I, I'm a pastor. I'm going to brag on you. Y'all are a little bit more lively than that first group was. And I know it's probably not because you prayed before you came. You went and got some coffee and you got a little up in you. You know, I pastor people and I understand that. It's hard to get people ready for church on Sunday morning, much less have an hour prayer meeting before you get here. But what a joy to see all of you today. And I am very thrilled to be here with Pastor Darrell and, and Pastor Lenita Williams and their fine girls, um, Haley and Elan and, and their son that's off fighting the war somewhere. Reeve, I didn't, I didn't get to see him this week, but what a joy to be here with them. And 10 years is awesome, folks. It really, it's awesome. It's an awesome time. I remember when we spent, 10 year, spent our first 10 years in Austin, Texas, and uh, what God had done for us. And now they put up with, I'm like an old shoe around there now, you know, I'm 31 years there. And uh, I've got a wonderful son-in-law that preaches the gospel wonderfully. He's 38 years old. I've got a daughter, 37, that's right there with him. And uh, they're married. They're married. And they got three kids. Forty years ago, I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I preached a camp meeting out here for an organization. I preached a camp meeting, and, uh, and I enjoyed it. And there was a man and his wife that I met that camp meeting. I was asked by other people, and he didn't know me, and I didn't know him. But Pastor Jesse and, and Sister Sue Williams took me under their wing and loved on me and cared for me because I was going through a crisis when I came. Had a six-year-old daughter that was with me, the, the only remaining part of my family I had lost that year in tragedy. And, and Sue Ann and Faye Williams, uh, Brother Darrell's aunts, and one of them's a member of this church, and I got to talk with her and her husband this morning. And I'm, I'm very nostalgic, so I'm going to take part of my preach time and talk about this. I had a six-year-old daughter that was here, that was hurting, and they, they, they kept her at the house that whole week I preached at camp. And uh, that girl's grown up. She's 46 years old now. Uh, 40 years later, she was six. 40, she's 46 years old now. She has a son that's married, and she's got an 18-year-old son that's right here. He's with me. So Connor is with me today, my grandson. He's my... He's my travel buddy when Patty can't come with me, and he don't mind it at all. He really doesn't. He gets to meet new people, and he's sitting with a pretty girl over here, and I, and, and, you know, I, that's all that, but, and a, and, a, and a box of chips. But anyhow, it's good to be with y'all today. It really, really is. You know, uh, Elisha was touched by a mantle and followed Elijah for 10 years and received a double portion. I believe this is double portion time for this church. I believe it's a double portion time for this congregation. David was anointed by Samuel at Jesse's house, and he was chased 10 years for, by Saul, and Saul couldn't touch him. And David had a chance to take him out, and he wouldn't do it. And so I just think that 10 is a beautiful number. You're either running to catch something, or you're running from something that's trying to destroy you. But the bottom line is that David ruled, and Elisha prophesied and did twice the miracles as did Elijah. And I just feel a ten spirit on this church. I feel like that God's got something great for you, powerful for you, wonderful for you. And let's go into this next year believing that God's got a bunch of good stuff waiting on us. Amen? Amen. Now, I'll be like Henry VIII told his fifth wife, I won't hold you long, I promise. But I want to speak today on one word. I'm going to speak on teman. Say teman. teman. Say teman. teman. What is that, Pastor? We're going to find out what that is today. You may be seated. Amen. Go down, clapping your hands and rejoicing, and you may be seated. My textual context will come today from the book of Habakkuk. You know, it's oftentimes, folks, that the shortest prayers produce the most profound results. When Elijah was on Carmel facing 850 false prophets, he prayed 63 words and fire fell. Peter's one sentence in Acts chapter 3, and a lame man got up and walked into the house of God. Paul used 14 words in Acts 16 to set a woman free 
from a spirit of divination. And Hezekiah the king, in his struggle to live, in Isaiah 38, prayed 29 words. And he mentioned three things. He said, Lord, I followed you in truth, and I've done it with a perfect heart, and I've done the right thing. And God healed him, and God gave him 15 more years. And we all know Jabez's prayer of 33 words has become a life-changing word to so many people, even in this house. The Bible says, and it says it real plain, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, righteous woman, righteous person avails much. There's two things here. There's a, a passionate prayer, one of fervency. I don't think that God likes bailout prayers. I think He enjoys passionate prayers when we just pray and say, God, I need help. And then a woman of, a man of passion that believes that God can. Habakkuk had a short prayer of 33 words in the second, in the third chapter, verse 2 and 3, when he said, O Lord, listen to this, this is powerful. I've heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, and in the midst of the years make known, and in wrath remember mercy. And the Bible said that God came from Teman. And the Holy One from Mount Paran and Selah. And His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of His praise. Do you love the Word today? You love the Word. Many times, short prayers have an urgency that long orations do not have. The Bible said when Habakkuk prayed that prayer that God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. And the reason God came is because prayer touched God. It always touches God. And whether you believe this or not, whether you think heaven's a glass ceiling or a or brass ceiling, whatever you think, anytime you pray, God hears that prayer. Amen. Say it with me. Amen. God hears that prayer. God came from where he was to where Habakkuk was because prayer touched God. And God will leave where he is to come to where the prayer is. I believe in prayer. I love to pray. I love to talk to God. I do it daily. I get up in the morning. I got to get a good attitude on and I pray till I get a good attitude. I want to tell you a funny story out of the Peace Corps in South America. They give handbooks to volunteers down there for their volunteers concerning the Amazon. You know, the Amazon's got this little old snake down there called the anaconda. He's about this long, you know. He's from here to that, that wall over yonder. He weighs about 300 and 400 pounds, and he's something else. And he don't bite you, he swallows you. He takes the whole loaf. And so they, they give 10 rules in this manual of what to do when you face or run into an anaconda. You want to hear them? I'm going to tell them anyhow. They said, do not run. Rule number one, anaconda can outrun you. They said simply, lay down. Oh, yes, lay down. Here's an anaconda, I'm going to lay down. Number three, tuck your chin, put your hands by your side, get real still. Number four, don't panic. I love that one. <laughs> don't panic. And number five, the snake will check you out. <clears throat> he will check you out from your feet up, always from your feet up. And number six, he'll start swallowing you from the feet up, always from the feet up. Now, my wonder is, has that anaconda gone to this handbook school and read this handbook? Where are you supposed to swallow it? Let this happen, number seven. Don't panic. There's that word again. Carefully, number eight, take a knife out of your scabbard. Place it between your legs under the snake's head <laughs> and rip up, killing the snake. Wow. Number nine, make sure you have a knife. <laughs> That's funny, folks. Get with me. Come on. That's funny. <laughs> number, number ten, make sure it's sharp. <laughs> Prayer still works. God still answers prayer. And He's still an on-time God. The story I'm about to tell you sounds fictional, but it's not. Believe me, it's true. You can, you can proof text it when you go home. In 1820, there was a man named Peter Richley. He was a grateful man. He survived the strangest event known to mankind. He was a part of the Australian Navy, and one day his ship that he was traveling on sank, and he was saved by a second ship. But a strange twist of circumstances, the second ship sank also. And he was rescued now for the second time by the third ship. And the third ship sank a couple hours later, same day. 
He was rescued again the third time by a fourth ship, and unbelievably that fourth ship sank. Same day. Miraculously, he was saved the fourth time by a fifth ship. Believe it or not, that ship sank. Five ships, four rescues, and he's still in the water. And he's laughing now in the water. He was serious. He floated on the high sea with a serene confidence that somehow God didn't want him to die that day. But he needed to send a better ship along. As if on cue, another ship came by and answered the call for help. It was called the City of Leeds. You need to read this story online. A liner from England. An England to Australian ship, Australia ship, traveling in the same sea lane as Peter Richley's down ships. And the crew saved Peter one more time and put dry clothing on him. Then the ship doctor gave him an exam because he'd been in the water most of the day. Clean bill of health and asked him for an unusual favor. He said, sir, there's a lady on board that booked passage to Australia. And she's looking for her son who disappeared 10 years ago. And she's dying and asked to see her son. She's kind of out of her head with a lot of fever. She knows everybody on board. And since you are the only newcomer, would you pretend to go in there and be her son? And Peter agreed. After all, his life had been saved five times, and he followed the doctor below to the deck and to the cabin. And there on a small bed lay a frail woman with silver hair. She was obviously suffering from a very high fever, and she was praying, Please, God, let me see my son before I die. I must see my son. And when Peter saw the woman, he began to weep because lying on that bed was the reason he just couldn't seem to die. He was in a prayer lifeline that kept him alive. He looked in the face of Sarah Richley his mother, whom he had left 10 years before in England and moved to Australia to become a part of the, of the Navy of Australia, who had prayed for him unceasingly to be reconciled to him. Here's what I want to tell you before I go further. Never, 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 never underestimate the power of prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So let's talk about teaming here a little bit. Teaming and pairing. The Bible calls it the most awesome manifestation in the Old Testament. It happened at Paran and the Sinaitic Range. Paran was on one side, Sinai was on the other. It was horseshoe shaped. And Teman was the land that was around it. And it was there that, the, that the, the, the Ten Commandments were given. It was there that the moral, civil, and ceremonial law was given to the people of God. It was there that where the mountain thundered and the mountain quaked and lightning came. And it was there that God spoke to His people. It was there just a little ways away that Moses saw a burning bush. It was there at Paran where angels descended and ascended because there was where they came to honor the God of heaven. It was... Deuteronomy 30, 33 says, a land, God, The Lord came from Sinai. He shined forth from Paran. In other words... God inhabited Sinai. He inhabited Paran. So Teman was a place of God's manifest glory. It was where it was happening. It was where it was the, the church. It was the mountains that were on fire for God. It means that God is moving. Teman does. It means to be current with God. And Teman simply means in the Hebrew, the right hand of power. It was God's right hand. It shows that God is declaring purpose. He is working. He's doing something for mankind. Yet, folks, a simple prayer. A simple 33-word prayer pierced God's heart. And he left Teman and came to Habakkuk. He came to Habakkuk, which proves, hear me now, and here's my punch right now. God will leave purpose anytime to come to a possibility. Yes, Amen. Amen. Say it with me. God will leave purpose to come to a possibility. I'm here to declare you're looking at a possibility today. If you knew my life, if you knew where I came from, if you knew the poor poverty I came out of and me preaching the gospel today with a little bit of education and understand that God took me from where I was to where He's placed me today, He will come from purpose to a possibility if you ask Him for help in your life. I believe that. God is not so wrapped up in making new stuff and creating stars and creating new galaxies and more constellations that He won't leave it in a heartbeat to find a possibility. God loves possibilities. Acts the 8th chapter is one of my favorite New Testament chapters of the whole New Testament, and it is in the book of Acts also. It was a Samaria revival. Samaria was the hottest place on the planet. 
unclean spirits in chapter 7 said came out and sick were healed and the palsied were touched. And in verse 8, the whole city had great joy and the Holy Spirit wasn't even given yet. Peter and John hadn't come to lay hands on them yet. I think it's pretty cool to think that I could live in a city that everybody had joy. Wow. It's a little different here in America now, isn't it? A little hate going on. But wouldn't it be cool to live in a city that had all joy? And not, not even the Holy Ghost hadn't even come yet. Boy, that'd be a great city. So I, that's why I like to preach about this. It was God's New Testament teaming. It's where God was moving. It was what was hot. It was the latest thing in God's arsenal of reaching this world. And so God spoke to a disciple, though, in that revival through an angel. In, in chap, chapter 8, verse 26, he said, Philip, I want you to rise and go toward the south and to the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And here is why. Philip, there's a man down there. He's a eunuch from Ethiopia, and he's down there praying. And he's reading my my word, and he's trying to figure it out. And I need somebody to go explain it to him so that he can get up and and be water baptized and go into what he's back doing and take the gospel that I have for him to his people. And Philip left that whole city, and God sent him that was in revival to save one man by one man. And listen to me, folks, the country of Ethiopia today is a country that bears the apostolic gospel right now because somebody left a whole city to go find one person because God is in to possibilities. Acts 10 is a story of two men. Peter was the leader of the church. He was the heart of purpose. Cornelius was a devout man, a Gentile. He was the heart of possibility. And in Acts 10 and 3, Cornelius saw a vision and an angel speaking to him and fear struck him. And he said, what do you want, Lord? And the angel spoke. He said, your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial before God. And God sent a sheet down three times on a rooftop at Simon the the Tanner's house. Sent a, sent a sheet down and let Peter see that sheet and said, Peter, whatever I have cleansed, don't call it common. And Pete, a Jew, went to a Gentile's house. God left the kingdom. He left everything he was doing to go save a house, to go save one family, to go save one family. God left purpose to find possibility. Do you believe that you might have been a possibility one time? Do you think you might have been? I think all of us were, and God found us where we were. We didn't find Him, He found us. And we fell in love with Him because He loved us first. God left Teman to go revive Habakkuk and the nation of Israel. When Adam and Eve failed, God could have started all over. We would have never known the difference, yet He was so in love with His first creation that He would rather revive it than start all over and make something new. I love the way this is in the Bible. Revelation chapter 13 says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's the lamb slain from the foundation. But Ephesians 1 says we're chosen in him before the foundation. So what God did, he created and then he made us a way of escape for us not to be lost. He created us first and then said, I'm going to put something in order for you because I want you to be saved. I read about a man... I read about a man one day that was driving his car and it broke down on him and he's kind of like me. He knew how to put gas in it. That's about all. And he got outside the car and and, uh, lifted the hood so people would think, you know, he was doing something. He knew nothing. He knew nothing. That was was like a Rubik's Cube he's looking at. He had no logic in him. And so a man came along in 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 a limousine and got out with a tuxedo on. And said, young man, you having a problem with that car? He said, yes, sir, I am. And the young man kind of grinned to himself. He said, this guy can't fix that car. He's a, he's a high roller. He can't fix this car. And, and the man said, why don't you get under the steering wheel when I tell you to hit the starter do it? And so he, he rolled up his sleeves and got under that hood and pull, unplugged this and plugged it here and hit this and tapped this. And he said, hit it. And that kid hit that starter. It started right up. He put the lid down, wiping his hands off, put his jacket back on, get ready to get in the car. And the young man said, how much I owe you, sir? He said, you don't owe me nothing. You don't owe me nothing. He said, well, who do I think? He said, well, my name's Henry Ford. (laughs) And he said, I made that car. And I can't stand to see one of my creations on the side of the road not running. I know a God in heaven. (laughs) Ah, Hallelujah. I know a God in heaven that sees us on the side of the road. He'll stop. 
and get out of where he is and come and where we are because he's into possibilities. He can't stand to see us on the side of the road not running down the highway. Come on, folks. It's time to believe that God is in the possibilities. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. Jesus had three and a half years to launch an eternal work. Yet he was interrupted time and again. The reason? For God to hit the pause button to reach one person. Like in Mark 5, the demonic man in the Gadarenes, he sensed the cry. He liberated him and sent him home. Or the woman of Samaria that went to draw water from the well and Jesus met her. Been married five times, living with her sixth husband. And she went and won a whole town because the Lord converted her. Or how about Mark 10, one blind man named Bartimaeus that got his healing. Or one lady in Matthew 9 that came up behind him and just touched his garment. And Jesus stopped. He stopped his journey to propagate the gospel of the church. He stopped for one woman. And he said, somebody touched me. And Pete was always so spiritually intelligent, you know. And he said, Lord, a lot of people's touched you. You're in a crowd, man. He said, no, Pete, I felt virtue flow out of me. Somebody's touched me. And she said, it's me, Lord. He said, daughter, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. I'm telling you, God was in to people and not purpose. God came from team and he shut down a whole multitude to save one possibility. The Bible said he left 90 and 9 in the, in the, just in the pasture to go find one lost sheep. Let me preach here a little. I'm here to declare that Fayetteville, North Carolina has a huge populace of possibilities. Yeah. I pastor in a city that has a huge populace of possibilities. And every Sunday morning when I get up, let me preach to you as a pastor now. Every Sunday morning when I get up, I think not of the church that I need to lift with the word, but at the possibilities that God's going to send in those doors because we are a church that's still a growing organism and we still have to move forward and get better in everything we do. We cannot be settled on our leaves. We have to understand God is in to possibilities in this city like he is in Austin, Texas. So we must enlarge. David talked about going from a teacup to a well to a river. A teacup, a well to a river. We've got to enlarge our capacity to receive what God has for us. I really believe what I said, that this probably is your 10-year double portion anointing. I think it's time to understand that, that God's got something great for this congregation. He's got something awesome for this congregation. I, I, I prayed an old boy through years ago that was a, a fabulous rock and roll musician in Austin. He played with Stevie Ray Vaughan. If you don't know who that is, it's no problem. You don't live in Austin. And he played, he played with Willie Nelson. If you don't know who that is, you're crazy. All right. And he played with some of these guys, Jimmy LaFave, you know, Just Walk Away, Renee, and all those people. And he was, he was a great lead guitar player. And he, he found Jesus. And he, and he stayed in our church for a number of years and moved away to another city. And I miss him even today because we have young men on our stage right now that play the guitar because he taught them how to play at six years old. And now they're Larry Juniors. You know what I'm saying? They're playing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, but he came to me one day and he said, Pastor, I want to share something with you. And I put this in my notes. I think it's funny. He said, I've got a blind friend, Pastor who says he's never seen an ugly woman. <laughs> I love that. He's never seen an ugly woman. You know why? Because he's blind to their ugliness. We got to get blind to what people aren't in our life and get bold at what people can be for God in our lives. Samuel got a new coat every year from his mother. Every year, one that was larger, never smaller. Living things grow, and we've got to expand our thinking. We've got to expand our faith and expand our prayer because God wants to come from Teman to a possibility. In Fayetteville, North Carolina, it failed for First Church. I believe that with all my heart. The blessing of heaven is going to go somewhere, and we have to enlarge our hearts to receive what possibilities God has for us. Calvary was His purpose, folks. He was on the cross. He came to die. And when they offered him honey and myrrh, a drug, a narcotic that would cause him to lose his consciousness, he, he would not take it. But wait a minute, Jesus. This is your purpose. You came to die. You came to give your life a ransom. That's why you came. 
This is why he's here. It's why he was, why he was born. He's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Calvary was his team and it was his purpose. But he put that on hold for one thief. A man that lived all of his life and never done one good thing. Being crucified by a man that all of his life had never done one bad thing. But he wouldn't take the medicine. He wouldn't take the, the, the thing that would knock him out so he would be unconscious when he passed. He wanted to wait because that thief said, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day, you're going to be with me in paradise. And every time I get up to preach a funeral, every time I get up to preach a gospel, I think of that man and I realize that I've got people that might have done some good things in their life. But this man had never done one good thing in his life. And he found salvation because he was a possibility. And God put Calvary on hold for a possibility. I'm here to declare, folks, this town is full of possibilities. And this church can reach those people. But you've got to be blind to their bad and sightseeing to the good that God can bring out of them in their life. Amen. Amen. God is interested in our prayers. He'll come to possibility. He'll come to possibility. I must close. I got a little lady that passed away several years ago named Marge Sloman. She was a pre preacher's wife, and I wrote about her in my book that I wrote about my tragedy. And, and she was a, a minister's wife, and, and she was so faithful. She, she, I called her my almond joy lady. She, she brought me all kinds of almonds. She said, if you eat nine almonds a day, you don't get cholesterol problems. So I ate about 15 or 20. <laughs> so I really wouldn't get cholesterol problems. She came to me one day. She said, Pastor, I got a, I've got an issue. She said, I, I, I know I'm going to die. I know I'm going to pass. I'm old. I'm not in good health. She was in her mid-80s. She said, I've been feeling that I need to talk to you. She said, I just need to tell you. She said, I got one fear. I got one fear. She said, I just, I, I don't want to die in the dark. She said, you think God would hear that prayer? <laughs> hey, God, I know I'm going to die, but I, don't let me die in the dark. Let me die in the day. I said, yeah, he'll, he'll hear that prayer. I believe God can do anything. Nothing impossible. So would you believe the night we got the call to come to the hospital? She's in a hospice area. And <clears throat> it was 2.30 in the morning. And I told my sweet wife, Patty, I said, baby, why has this happened? What, what, what's going on? Why does this happen? It's 2.30. All that woman, all she ever wanted was just to die in the daylight. That's all. We got to the room and she was unconscious and 3.30 came, 4.30 came, 5.30. Somewhere around 6, I had the blinds pulled because I was going to try to tell her, I was going to repent about it, but I was going to try to tell her that it was light outside if she died. I didn't have to. I went to the window at 6 o'clock and looked out and the sun was up. It had already breaking, broke over the eastern horizon. It was up. And I came back to her and she was out. She was, I said, I said to Marge, sun's up, it's daylight outside. And she came out of that coma for just two words. She said, thank you. Went back to sleep and left us in five minutes. Now, now, that's a great story, but it doesn't end there. It was a Wednesday. I had church that Wednesday night, and I got to the car about 11 that morning. We waited till the funeral home came to get her. And I got in my car, and it was 11 o'clock, and the meteorologist came at the top of the hour on my favorite radio program and said, folks, we had a phenomenon. I said, it was an anomaly today in Austin, all of Texas, in fact, all over, all over the world, I guess, he said. He said the sun was scheduled to come up at 6.05 today. It came up at 6. said, we want to apologize for missing that. For all you people that want us to be precise with our sunrise time. He said the sun came up five minutes early today. And I thought I was hearing something. I got to church and I got besieged with people. Pastor, did you hear? We think the Lord might be coming. The sun came up earlier today than normal. And I preached that night about this precious lady who told her story. And it, it revolutionized the church that I pastor in. Because if God can stop the sun for Joshua and make it go backwards 10 degrees for Hezekiah, why couldn't he let it come forward? 
Five minutes for a little lady that said, I don't want to die in the dark. Oh, yeah, that's a big amen. Come on, that's a big amen. That's a big amen. It happened. It happened. I close today. Uh, I don't want to hold you. I'm a pastor, not an evangelist, and I don't believe in holding you, but I could preach to you all three more hours. I could tell you stories for three more hours. I was riding home from Washington. I closed with this. I was riding home from Washington State. I'd preached to camp, and the, the district had bumped me up, and I was riding up in the front of the plane. Had a seat beside me empty, and I hate that because I love people. Folks, I don't eat by myself. You understand that? I don't eat by myself. I eat with people. I know Thomas Jefferson said, when I dine alone, I dine with genius. Well, when I dine with people, I dine with good sense. All right? So I was on my way home, and would you believe it was during the Afghan-Iraqi conflicts that we had? And they brought a, a soldier up in his full fatigues, camo, an officer. I said, man, I'm lucky today. I get to sit by a soldier. I get to sit by a warrior. And I hugged him. I said, young man, I'm a, I'm a father, and I'm a grandfather, and I love the military and I love what you are and what you've accomplished and thank you. I said, now we can talk or I can let you lay over there and go to sleep. He said, oh, sir, I think I'd like to talk to you. So we talked. So I asked him, I said, what's the, what's the neatest thing you ever, you ever witnessed in the military? He said, that's not easy, hard to answer. He said, he was at boot camp. I said, well, I went to boot camp and said, this guy came in said he had hair out to here and it was dyed a different color about every two inches said he had every color that you could imagine in that hair had an afro and said we could just all just imagine what his scalp was going to look like when they shaved his head and he said we told him when he walked in said man you're not you're not an army man get out of here you're not going you're going you're going to go AWOL you're going to quit you're not going to make it and he said I am army I am army he said when we went in the, the barracks a little later, he had already got his hair cut and he had his shirt off and said, we realized he had something under that shirt. And said he kind of did this. He said, all right, anybody want to take on rainbow head? Psychedelic head, anybody want me? He said, I'll, I'll defend what I am right here, right now. Nobody took him on. They didn't want none of him. Because he was just asking, I'll fight you right now. That's the kind of guy I want to take to heaven. I really do. I don't want somebody running and hiding. And so I said, well, what's the story? He said, well, you became an army ranger. You got into special forces. So you became a leader of that force. And he said, sir, you know this Saddam Hussein that we've all kind of wanted to get? He said, guess who it was that got him out of that spider hole? Guess who brought him out? It was that young man's platoon that brought him out. He said, we thought Somebody that we never thought would even be in the army captured one of the most awesome death agents in the whole world because he said he told us, I am army. And now we believe him. Possibilities. And you know what, folks? I'm just going to declare, I'm going to prophesy over this congregation right now. You ready? I don't do this a lot, but I'm going to prophesy. There's going to be people walk in that door that you're going to say, God, who are they? Who is that? Who is that? I've had them walk in Austin's door and I say, oh my God, where'd they come from? But let God clean them up. Let God turn them upside down. Let God do something. And they're going to do this one day. I am church. <laughs> I am church. This is what I am. This is what I've been looking for my whole life because I believe that I'm preaching to a double portion church, a 10 year church that's ready to step into a new dimension, a new journey, a new adventure, and a new touch from God. Are you going to receive that? Would you stand to your feet, clap your hands, and receive that in the name of the Lord. Amen. That's the gospel I brought to you today. Everybody say, God came from Teman. And the Holy One from Mount Perrin. And I've gone over a little bit, but that's all right. I probably won't be back for a long time, so you'll get over that four minutes. Pastor will make it up next Sunday to you. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I love you very much. Brother Darrell. Sister Lanita, thank you for the privilege. Dear Father, in the name of the Lord, I bless this congregation. I bless them today. I thank you for the joy 
and the peace and the contentment that I feel in this house. God, I feel that they are running into an anointing in this house that they're not going to be able to escape. This pastor, his wife, have been saying, God, revive us. Bless this church. Enlarge this church. We want to build a, a tabernacle, a, 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 a congregation that will seat a thousand people with a new lobby. We want that. We want to stretch our, our, our tents. We want to enlarge our tents. And we want to strengthen our stakes. And elongate our ropes. We want to do that. God, I ask you to bless this congregation with that kind of anointing, with that kind of purpose. And come from where you are to where they are because possibilities are going to be a part of this place. And God, that 500 figure that he talked about, Lord, in the next year, in the next two years, let that be a, a yearly total. Let that be something yearly that we baptize 500 people in a year. Let it happen, God. Bring a double portion. Bring an anointing on this place. God, let it happen. I'm praying for that right now for this congregation. And I'm going to be finding, I'm going to be following them and understanding that you're going to do that for, for First Church Fayetteville. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, receive it now, receive it now, receive it now, receive it now, receive it in the name of the Lord. Now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if something needs healing in this house, I always feel a special urgency to pray for those kind of people or somebody needs deliverance from something. I'm going to dismiss this crowd, but as soon as I dismiss them, if you'd like to come forward, I'll meet you over here. We'll pray all at once. I'll come by and I'll pray for every one of you, but we'll pray all at once. And I'd like to bless you before you leave. I love you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for letting me be in your life today. And if you're ever in Austin, come see us on the south side. God bless. We love you today. All right. Come on, folks. If you want to come, come on, folks.